So thanks for attending. It's an honor to be the, the first talk for this track. Uh, a few words about me. So I've been working for NLP for quite a while, for the last five years. Before that, I used to work also in the machine learning um, on computer vision in Kinect, you can not so standard computer vision. Computer vision. Uh, I've been working for AT&T, for Yahoo, and most recently for Best Practice, leading the, uh, leading the data science over there. Uh, what we do at Best Practice is basically we apply NLP on legal documents, as you'll see some examples today. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. First, we'll discuss about legal language and how it differs from English that you'll find on the web. And then we'll cover three cool use, case, three cool use cases that hopefully at least some of them would be also useful for you. Okay, so let's begin. There's nothing more natural to begin than with a disclaimer. This presentation is being delivered as is. Uri, here by the speaker, takes no responsibility for, just kidding. So, as you can see, this is not really spoken English. No one in his right mind would actually speak like that between friends. So, legal English can be considered as a dialect of English rather than the true English spoken on the streets. But on the other hand, even in, in this short intro, we can see that legal English has a lot of structure. For example, we have defined terms, the presentation, being defined and can be referred later. We have a lot of meanings for capitalization. All defined terms must be, must be capitalized. We have a lot of uh, the phrases, for example, as is, which have a, a legal meaning different from uh, simple English. And all of, these all of these things can be taken into account when applying NLP algorithms. Okay, so to compare like regular English or things that you usually would find when applying NLP tasks with legal documents, the most obvious difference is that legal documents are far, far, far longer. This is like the most, uh, the most obvious difference. The second, which is actually an advantage, is that legal English is much more conservative. You won't see as much spelling errors as you would see in uh, written English or posts or tweets, etc. And you won't see a lot of slangs. So it means that those are not familiar with OOV, OOV is out of vocabulary. It means that if you build a vocabulary of all possible words in the English language or in the legal English language, you, you won't be surprised as much as processing, for example, Wikipedia articles. Also, for the same reasons, the grammar is pretty much fine. It's not that you won't find any grammatical errors, but far, far less. And there are a lot of phrases that we can take account of. For example, governing law is a phrase and can be regarded as one token since it repeats a lot of times. So I guess that no one here sees a contract for the first time, but this is the general, the base class that all contracts inherit from. All contracts have a title, whether it's an employment agreement, an underwriting agreement, and an NDA. Then we have a preamble. Preamble is why do we need to sign this agreement at all? For example, since Uri has the qualifications to do something and the company would like to hire Uri, therefore we all came to this moment that this is a preamble. It's a short, like they can be seen as an abstract of a, of a paper. Then we have a list of definitions. Let Uri be defined as the employee. Uh, the company shall refer to, etc. Then we have a lot of numbered clauses that depends on the type of the contract itself. Then we have the, signat the signature page and a list of appendices. Which brings us to our first use case, which is identifying synonyms 
in defined terms. So let's have a look at these three defined terms. Buyer shall have the meaning the depository trust company and its successor, any successor there, there too. Purchaser, almost same phrasing, shall have the meaning of same company. Or DTC, initials of the company, also have the same meaning. Now, this is a good point to stop and to say what, what, what problem is best practice actually solving. So, best practice is a word plugin that once a lawyer gets a draft from the other side, he can uh, iterate through the different clauses and see what other changes lawyers usually did, what is common and what is not so common uh, in each clause. So, to do this, we encounter two types of, two considerations. On the one hand, we don't want to suggest clauses that have nothing to do with the context and don't look like the clause that he's working on. But on the other hand, we don't want to suggest the same clause again and again. So for example, if, the, if one clause has the phrase buyer and the other one has the phrase purchaser, it's the same clause. There's no need to bother the lawyer with the two suggestions that are semantically the same. So to account for this issue, uh, we tackled it with the world to vec model. How many of you have heard about the world to vec model? Great, that's uh, a lot of hands. So it worked almost perfectly in our case. What we did is in the first stage, we actually split the document into tokens according to the defined terms. For example, governing law would be a single token in our tokenization, which if you were to split according to white space, it would be two tokens. Then we trained our own world of model on legal contracts and other publicly, uh, publicly available legal documents. And then every time we suggest a clause, we look at the, at the word similarity, the word to vec similarity between each defined terms and the defined terms that from the original contract. If they are too similar, then we unite them together. A, a very, very high level simplification of how word to vec uh, work. Those who train word to vec please don't be mad at me. <laughs> Uh, what to fact try to predict a center word according to context word, assuming that words that appear in similar contexts have the same meaning. For example, the capital of blank is London. If you were to iterate through a lot of uh, sentences in the corpus, hopefully the center word would, would look like some kind of country and state or state, and the context word will stay the same. At the end of this process, we would have something like this, which actually doesn't mean a lot. For those who worked with bag of words models, this vector doesn't mean much on its own, but it can help us to predict similar phrases. Uh, this is actual, an actual example from our data set. The words mo most similar to customers are, to customer, are client, which makes like a ton of sense. Supplier, customers, also made a lot of sense. Advertisers, top is uh, probably a, uh, an error. Advertiser, so you can see that it actually, it captured a lot of, um, it kept, captured a lot of synonyms without giving it any label data, which is like super cool. So talking about label data, we we'll start talking about, uh, our next uh, use case will be how to annotate data when your annotators are super expensive, in our case, lawyers. So this is the problem setting. We have a lot of unlabeled contracts. We have a few very expensive American lawyers. But contracts are very similar to one, to one another. Lawyers love to copy and paste. So why not take advantage of, uh, of this fact? Okay, so this is the main, the main idea. The main idea is to apply clustering and then have the lawyer label one sample from each cluster. 
Then we take the, uh, the label that the lawyer labeled and apply it to the rest of the cluster. Hopefully, not introducing too many labeling errors. This is the motivation. Okay, so the first uh, phase is to take our entire contract, our entire document, and transform it into a vector that we can later feed into a clustering algorithm. There are plenty of ways to do it. Uh, one of them is word to vector that we mentioned earlier. Uh, we applied for this uh, use case, we applied a classic bag of words vectorization. Uh, it could be done like with two lines of Python, and if you want to apply TFIDF, then three lines of Python, it's super easy. Uh, usually, when I mention clustering, people think about k-means. K-means is like the top brand for clustering algorithms. But there's another family of clustering algorithms that's actually more suitable for this use case. So, just a few words on the differences. K-means can be seen as a top-down approach or a divisive, being dividing the space approach. What k-means does is it throws k random clusters into the, into the space and shakes them and moves them around according to some uh, EM step, never mind. But the main logic behind k-means is that data points that are centered around those, uh, those random points, those k centroids, would have the same cluster. This is the idea. So I need to specify that k, the number of random clusters that I will start with, and I will need to specify a way to move them around, and that's how all top-down algorithm, top-down clustering algorithm works. Uh, for this use case, we applied the bottom-up approach, also known as the hierarchical approach, in which we start with n clusters, n being the number of data points, and at each phase, we unite two data points that are closest together. And our stopping criteria would be the minimal distance that we consider two points to have the same cluster. Okay, so let's see how that could be done in Python. All hierarchical clustering algorithms get three parameters. The metric, how do I measure the distance? The cutoff, when do I stop what is our, uh, my, stopping, my stopping criterion, and the bound, where do I measure the distance from. Again, in like six lines of Python, you can apply, you can apply hierarchical clustering for your project. Uh, you need to choose the metric. Actually, for our case, it was neither, neither one of those, the rightmost one is the L2, leftmost one is the L1. Uh, for our case, what works best was the Jacquard metric. And to apply the, the bound, where do I measure the distance from? As you can see, uh, you can measure distance either from the center of the new cluster, from the bound, from the furthermost point, and I guess that that's probably all the possibilities that uh, you, can, uh, you can use. Um, how many of you have applied clustering algorithms? Great. Now, how many of you know how to measure clustering algorithms? There's like one hand over there, which is great. There are a lot of ways. There's like silhouette and variance within, variance between. Neither of them was useful in this use case because we have a target here. What we want to do is to save money. So what we did is we labeled a small portion of our data beforehand, and uh, we took a look how did the clusters uh, separate, how did the data points distribute between the clusters and the labeled data points. Just uh, these are three possible outcomes of our clustering algorithms. Uh, in all of these examples, we have 10 data points with five clusters and three labels. The labels are A, B, and C, and the clusters are one to five. As you can see, the two, the two tables marked with a V 
we are pretty much oblivious within, within them. We don't care how many points are in each cluster, but in the case that one cluster would, cont would contain points from different labels, that's, that, when, that is when we know that we are going to introduce some labeling error. So taking this consideration into account, on one hand, we want as little clusters as possible because we want to save money and we don't want to have any mixed clusters. One can come up with some kind of metric that is actually more, more intuitive and more helpful than silhouette score or any other general purpose clustering uh, algorithm evaluation. Okay, any questions so far, by the way? Okay, so the question was, uh, if your data is, an, is truly unlabeled, what is the purpose of uh, this exercise? And what we did is we labeled a small portion of the data points in order to evaluate the clustering algorithm, and, and then we had uh, an option to evaluate it. Uh, our last use case is splitting a document into clauses. So as we've seen earlier, this is like the general structure of um, a legal document. And if, aside from the defined terms, we also want to split it into clauses in a way that uh, makes sense. Usually, uh, formatting helps a lot. So usually each clause starts with enumeration and some, and some kind of formatting, either in, in underline or uh, bold. Uh, but unfortunately, formatting is not always consistent and also a small amount of the documents are not formatted at all or formatted in some very weird way with uppercase and question marks and people are very creative. So the idea is to take documents that were formatted correctly, learn how to format a document according to its context. For example, governing law is a name of a clause then governing law usually should be in bold or in headline, and I can know to label it just from, purely from context. And then once I train the model how, that, formats, that formats a document from context, I can split the document according to the, the styling. Okay, uh, after much thought and much wrangling, we applied pretty much a standard architecture, an LSTM with a decoder. Now, it might be a bit surprising, but for our use case, an LSTM actually worked better than a by LSTM, since all of the formatting appears in the beginning of a clause. So the by LSTM wasn't, didn't add a lot of information. So it's also good to note that you need to understand your data and to have a look at the structure and it could save you also a lot of time and better performance. So, what we saw in this, what we've seen so far, we covered three use cases, the defined terms, finding defined term synonyms, uh, with the word back. We covered how to annotate data when your annotators are pretty expensive, using hierarchical clustering, and we covered, uh, and we covered how to recover formatting using an LSTM network. Okay, any questions? So the question was, did we take into account that the initial labeling itself could be noisy and then our metric could be noisy? Uh, the short answer is no, <laughs> but we might should have. Okay, so the question was, usually LSTM is being applied on shorter documents and not entire clauses. And actually, since formatting usually appears in the beginning of the clause, then we didn't need to fit the entire clause. We can ju just assume that any word after like the 20-something word wouldn't have any formatting. Uh, it's a good heuristics, but uh, I guess that in, in the general case, you can't really make that assumption. Great, so thank you so much for your time. And next up for me would uh, Ari on the Beyond Water Bedding.